Welcome to our weekly study where we have been studying through the Christian graces from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. Let's start again this week with reading the text for the basis of our study, 2 Peter 1, verse 3. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure, for if you practice these qualities you will never fall. For in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The English Standard Version in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 6 uses the word steadfastness. And if you're reading from the New American Standard or from the New King James, you see the word perseverance. Both are faithful to the intent of the Holy Spirit, but for me the word steadfastness provides a clearer mental image. When I think of steadfast, I think of the armor of God from Ephesians chapter 6. I have this mental image of being completely equipped in the armor and then ready to stand against the enemy. In my mind, the soldier is standing with the shield up, feet planted firmly, and ready to hold the line. But steadfastness has implications. It implies that one is ready and one is equipped for the spiritual battle that has come or is coming. I think this is why Peter and the Holy Spirit did not put it earlier in the list. There was some preparation that was needed before you could be steadfast. You needed the foundation of faith, virtue, knowledge, and self-control in order to be equipped for that spiritual battle. The word here that is translated steadfastness in the ESV is also often translated as patience or endurance. It is a product of strength that re results in the ability to withstand hardship or stress. It refers to one's inner fortitude. A reason that we might like the word steadfast a little more than we like patience is that we view patience as difficult. We have trouble practicing patience. Steadfast is slightly more foreign to us. It's not a word we use every day. We can view ourselves then more positively in regards to this word. I think we need to combine the two in order to truly understand the meaning that is in this passage. The fact is, we cannot be steadfast unless we have the patience and the endurance. How long do we remain steadfast? Well, as long as we're here. That requires patience and endurance. Job stands as a good example for us in understanding the idea of steadfastness. In James chapter 5 and verse 11, it says, Behold, we consider those blessed who remained steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job and have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Job and his family were under assault by Satan. He lost his children, his livelihood, his possessions, and yet he would not give in. He had many questions, but he did not yield to it at all. We may not un be under the same kind of assault, that is, losing our family or our livelihood, etc. But we are still under assault. We are faced with temptation and the ungodliness of this world. We must likewise bear up under the assault and stay faithful. We must remain steadfast. If we do a word search for steadfast, you find that it's often used in the Old Testament referring to God. Psalm 59 and verse 10 says, My God in his steadfast love will meet me. In the book of Ezra, chapter 3 and verse 11, it says that they sang responsively 
praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. In the Psalms, in 13, verses 5 and 6, it says, But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. These are all good examples of the steadfast love and the steadfast faithfulness of God. But we can then apply our understanding of God to ourselves that we must also be steadfast, trustworthy, enduring. But we don't always feel strong and steadfast. Sometimes we get beaten down and even depressed. It happens to all of us. Even David, who was described as a man after God's own heart, chosen by God, anointed to become king, strengthened by God to do incredible things, such as fighting off predators to protect his flock, and even defeating Goliath. But he ended up facing some very trying times in his life. Some of those times were consequences of his own actions, and others were not. He wrote the 142nd Psalm during the time when Saul was chasing him down to kill him. He had many opportunities to end that situation by killing Saul, but he wouldn't do it. He persevered under a difficult situation, and he still faced even depression. In that 142nd Psalm, it says, With my voice I cry out to the Lord. With my voice I plead for mercy to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before Him. I tell Him my trouble. When my spirit faints within me, you know my way. In the path where I walk, they have hidden a trap for me. Look to the right and see. There is none who takes notice of me. No refuge remains to me. No one cares for my soul. I cry to you, O Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Attend to my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are too strong for me. Bring me out of prison, that I may give thanks to your name. The righteous will surround me, for you will deal bountifully with me. We need to learn to do what David did. Cry out to God for help when we feel like we are nearing the limits of our endurance. Prayer is an avenue to share with God all of our concerns and feelings. He wants us to utilize His great source of comfort and strength and for us to trust Him to carry us through. This is what David was doing. He was placing his trust in God to carry him through a very difficult time. Jesus likewise taught this same concept when he told his disciples and us, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Ken Welliver wrote regarding perseverance, saying that it is the antidote to weariness. It is hanging in there for another day. Maybe sometimes it is hour by hour, but it will get you from one moment to the next. In the throes of weariness, remember that your life is not futile. It counts because God cares, and He has a purpose for you and the burden that you are bearing. As you can see, if we have not built up our knowledge of God, of His will, and of the peace that comes as a child of God, then weariness sets in much faster. Remaining steadfast when everything is smooth sailing is relatively easy, but doing so under the most difficult of circumstances that we encounter in this life requires a strong faith. It is imperative that we realize that, as with all of the Christian graces that Peter is presenting, we must give diligence to this effort. Spiritual growth is such that if we neglect it, then we regress. Note Jesus' words to the Ephesian church in Revelation chapter 2. He said, But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love that you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works that you did at the first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, 
unless you repent. They needed to go back to the beginning and build themselves up again, repenting of abandoning the love that brought them to obedience and faith in the first place. Later in Second Peter, over in chapter 2, Peter pointed out that Christians can regress so far that they are again entangled in the polluted world that is around them. He said in verse 20 through 22, For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For if it would have... Excuse me, for it would have been better for them never to have known the way of the righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit, and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. If we are going to remain steadfast, then we must exercise ourselves in godliness, giving diligence to our spiritual growth that may, that means that making every effort to supplement our faith with virtue and our virtue with knowledge and our knowledge with self-control so that we may never fall. Brethren, these are trying times. The world will always be full of chaos and disappointment. God offers true promises and steadfast love toward us. Let us then remain faithful to Him, steadfast, persevering as we sojourn in this world, having our spiritual vision firmly focused upon the eternal life promised by our Heavenly Father. I leave this study to you to help it build you up in faith. I pray that it has been useful, and I ask that you join me again next week as we continue this study.